This week on Christian World News, arrested for preaching the gospel. Police in the United Kingdom tell this street preacher, preacher your message isn't wanted. Plus, a high-stakes summit falls apart and President Trump comes under fire over the death of an American college student. Why human rights advocates say he's not doing enough to challenge Kim Jong-un. And nearly 25 years after the genocide in Rwanda, churches are leading the way in building a new society. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. Well, Britain, once the home of world missions, is today increasingly hostile to the gospel. Police are under fire after arresting an elderly Nigerian man for preaching in the streets. Dale Hood has the story from London. I can be arrested for if you want. His name is Preacher Alu. He's a London street preacher who was arrested last Saturday for breach of the peace and Islamophobia. Phone video of his arrest was spread worldwide on social media. The woman who shot the video, Ambrosine Shitrit, spoke to CBN News in this exclusive interview. A man with a hoodie was trying to humiliate, to be aggressive towards this Christian street preacher. I could see that he was a Muslim man because he was talking about, no, Allah is the right way. But London police didn't arrest the Muslim man threatening a Christian preacher. They arrested preacher Alu. Britain is officially a Christian nation, but if someone is street preaching and another person complains about it, British police are quick to move in. You are preaching. I'm going to require you to go away. You can never. OK, then I will arrest you for a breach of peace. Plain and simple. What breach of peace? It's what you're doing at the moment. You're causing problems, you're disturbing people's days, and you're breaching their peace. But Shitrit says the only person being disturbed by preacher Alu was the Muslim man. Nobody was offended by the preaching. Nobody. Andrea Williams of the Christian Legal Center is advising Preacher Alu of his legal rights. This was completely an overreach of their authority. There was no basis upon which to arrest Pastor Alu. One of the officers even ripped the Bible from Preacher Alu's hands. Don't take my Bible away. Preacher Alu was reportedly driven out of the area and, in the words of the police, de-arrested and dumped in an area without money to get home. Williams said she's not sure if Preacher Alu will bring charges against the police. She says she sees cases like this against Christian preachers on almost a weekly basis. Dale Hurd, CBN News, London. Thank you, Dale. You may find this hard to believe, but in Washington, there's a group of Democrats and Republicans coming together to shine a light on religious persecution around the world. That's right. Jennifer Wishon introduces us to one woman who's taken up the call to protect the persecuted. Gail Manchin is the wife of Democrat West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. She's approaching her latest endeavor with families in mind. Families torn apart when a loved one is imprisoned for practicing their faith. When you see people in other countries that literally are willing to die, rather than to uh, renounce what they believe, certainly gives you a different perspective on life. Manchin began seeing this last spring after joining the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom. Were you surprised at, at what a huge issue this is globally? Yes, because even though I had, I guess, an awareness, uh, had no idea the extent uh, of abuse and violation to, for human rights as well as religious beliefs. Made up of nine members spanning the ideological spectrum, the commission represents different faiths and traditions. And one of the things that you do is you have a prisoner of conscience program. Tell me about that. We found that if you can put a face to an issue, how much uh, more it resounds with the public and, and people get the message better. Case in point, Andrew Brunson, the pastor recently freed after spending two years in a Turkish prison. A commissioner adopted Brunson, visited him while captive, and applied pressure on Turkey to release him. Tell me about the folks you've adopted. Both are from Iran. Mr. Tahiri 
is a writer. He was on, had been taken from prison, was retried and put on death row. And then just recently, was taken back out and taken off death row, but his sentence has been extended for five more years. Do we hope that perhaps him being a prisoner of conscience helped raise the awareness and took him off death row? We, we don't know, but we certainly hope so. Uh, my other uh, uh, prisoner is a woman, Golrock Irahe. She was writing about the injustice of women being stoned for, cre for committing adultery. And for that, um, she was arrested for breaking Islamic sanctities. Her writings were not even published. They came into her home and confiscated writings and found this and used that against her. Manchin has learned from Arahi's sister that this attention from America makes a difference. What I have found in serving on this commission and traveling to other countries, they care about what the United States thinks of them. And the fact that we bring out these uh, violations and discriminations, you know, gives them pause, I believe. But it takes patience. Nine prisoners of conscience have been released, yet the overall situation grows more serious with each passing day. It is a commitment and dedication to a, a large issue, a global issue that is not getting better, unfortunately. Uh, it seems like that in many of the countries that we are watching, uh, it, the conditions are deteriorating, not getting better, and so we cannot let up. The U.S. promotes religious freedom around the world because countries that allow its people to worship freely tend to be friendly neighbors. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Up next, tortured in a North Korean prison camp. Arda Warmbier died just days after his, his release. Why isn't President Trump holding Kim Jong-un accountable? CBN presents The Eye Wills of God, your path to overcoming fear and anxiety. We're going to talk about some of the incredible promises God has made to his children. In Pat Robertson's newest teaching, you'll discover the I wills of God. I will rescue him, protect him, answer him, be with him in trouble, deliver him, honor him, satisfy him with long life, show him my salvation, and see amazing stories of God's promises in action. What I felt was loved and treasured. God spared my life twice in three days. The good Lord had given me a second chance. Break free from stress and despair. The Lord doesn't want you to live in fear, but to know the rewards given to those who love God. Call 1-800-700-7000 or visit CBN.com. The I Wills of God, your path to overcoming fear and anxiety. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. My husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. President Trump is taking heat after the Hanoi summit last week, but it's not for walking away. It's for his response to a question about American college student Otto Warmbier. Warmbier died after suffering torture in a North Korean prison camp. Asked if he confronted Kim Jong-un about Warmbier's death, the president said he doesn't believe the dictator had anything to do with it. That triggered a response from human rights advocates and a senator from Ohio, Warmbier's home state. I mean, you never should go meet with a North Korean dictator without bringing up the name Otto Warmbier. 
and bring up the whole issue of human rights over and over. That's who we are as a country. Warmbier's family is also speaking out, blaming Kim for their son's death. The Hanoi summit broke down when the North Korean leader refused to get rid of all of his nukes while demanding that the Trump administration lift economic sanctions. Joining me now is Todd Nettleton, host of Voice of the Martyrs Radio. And by the way, he has written a book about North Korea. Thanks for joining us here. Uh, you know, Kim Jong-un wanted economic sanctions lifted on his country. Tell us how bad the economic situation is for the average North Korean. Well, the economic sanction is horrible. Even the, the thought of getting enough to eat uh, is a daily challenge for North Korean's people. Uh, and, you know, I, the description I like best is North Korea is a prison camp disguised as a country. Everyone there is oppressed, but Christians are singled out for the very worst persecution. If sanctions were lifted, would it make a difference for them, or do the country's problems go deeper than that? Well, the country's problems go very much deeper, and I would start with uh, just the definition of a person. The definition of a person in North Korea is someone who is useful to the Kim regime. So when you think about who needs food, who needs uh, shelter, who needs clothing, the persons are the people who the regime finds useful. If you're not useful to the regime, you don't even deserve to have those things. So the just the level of oppression and the level of hardship is hard for us to fathom. Can you tell us what the country's Christians are hoping for in terms of any sort of agreement uh, with the United States? Well, you know, I think uh, North Korean Christians understand their complete dependence on God. And so while they hope for peace for their country, they hope for peaceful relations with the rest of the world, they understand that their daily sustenance and their daily ability to survive is God's blessing on them. And so uh, I don't think they're particularly worried about, oh, you know, if this peace agreement gets signed, this will happen or that'll happen or the borders will be open or they'll stay closed. They are really dependent on God for even moment-by-moment moment daily sustenance. Todd, as you know, the folks at Open Doors for the last 18 years in a row, they've described North Korea as the worst place in the world, the worst place in the world for Christians. Uh, in the last two years, as we've had this uh, um, uh, dialogue with, with the North Koreans, has the plight of Christians gotten any better or has it gotten worse? You know, I don't think it's gotten better. And one of the things that we hope is a part of this dialogue between our president and Chairman Kim will involve Christians, will involve religious freedom. And I have not seen reporting of that yet, but certainly we hope as they're sitting at the table, we know they're talking about nuclear arms. I hope they're talking about religious freedom as well. How can we pray uh, for uh, our brothers and sisters in, in North Korea? You know, I think as we think about the terrible oppression, we think about 30,000 plus Christians that are in concentration camps. Let's pray that they survive this day. Let's pray they have enough to eat. Pray for God's protection on them. And I think we can pray that they'll continue to be a witness as witnessing in North Korea is a ticket to a concentration camp. So it has to be handled very, very carefully. But let's pray that God will open doors and that our brothers and sisters can wisely share the gospel with those around them. Okay, terrific. Todd, as always, uh, thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. President Trump highlighted Vietnam as an example to Kim Jong-un. Just like North Korea, the U.S. fought a war with Vietnam. But today, the two countries are friends, and the communist country has a booming economy. Our Lucille Toulousen was in Hanoi for the summit, and she spoke with a pastor about life in Vietnam. We are right now here at a coffee shop here in Hanoi. It's called Miriam's Coffee Shop. And, uh, you know, coffee is really very special here in Vietnam, and it's really famous for its coffee. Right now, I have here a pastor here in Hanoi, uh, Pastor Man Nguyen. Nguyen. Yes. <laughs> uh, please join us here. Um, how is the church growth here in Hanoi, specifically in Hanoi? You know, the church here in Hanoi, we have uh, uh, the, we look at it as positive things. Mm -hmm. We see the young people, they start coming to the Lord and also the professionals, they want to uh, look for uh, the answer for their life. That's why they come to church and they believe in Jesus and uh, 
transformed their life. So mm -hmm. we are happy about it. Yes. Yeah. How do you think uh, is the coming of President Trump yep. to Vietnam? How does that help the churches here? I believe the uh, the fact that President Trump comes to Vietnam it so that Vietnam are opening to the world, and Vietnam can make the positive uh, example of how we can become the place of peace and uh, uh, prosperity. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, is it uh, also um, an inspiration or an encouragement to the churches that? Uh, a Christian president comes to your country? Yes, I certainly say Vietnam has become more open to uh, America. So it's so it means how much the country wants to be open to the outside world mm -hmm. and open to the different things, including Christianity, to come into Vietnam to spread it all over the country. Mm -hmm. I believe I, it I is think a I success. can smell the Vietnamese coffee. Really? Yeah. You want, have you tried it? <laughs> you should try it. Thank you to the owners, um, Mr. Mr. Tam. Mr. Tam and, and Ms. Mrs. Kim Tien. Mrs. Kim Tien. Thank yes. you very much, sir. Yeah. And uh, they have their coffee shop is one of their ministries here in Vietnam. And maybe we can taste the coffee. Yes, you should yeah. taste uh, Vietnamese coffee when you are in Vietnam. Yeah. We are famous we about it. Vietnam. Here you go. Thank you. Whoa, why is it very dark? <laughs> <laughs> so here, this is the typical uh, Vietnamese way. coffee. Vietnamese coffee, yeah, but it is like an espresso. Yeah, or? yeah, espresso okay. is very good. This is a local coffee. Mm, I am drinking very for good. all of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, I believe it's good that you will uh, you will miss coffee, Vietnam Vietnamese coffee, and you will come to Vietnam more often. Right. It's very good Vietnamese coffee. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lucille Talusa, drinking Vietnamese coffee here in Hanoi. God bless you all. Oh, so jealous, Lucille. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Up next, recovering from a genocide. Nearly 25 years after close to 1 million people died in Rwanda, the church is leading the way in reconciliation. Parents, the Superbook Bible app is a great way to get your child reading the Bible because in today's busy world, we can use some help. The free Superbook Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available now. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life. Life to the fullest. Life in your family. Life in your finances. Life in your body, mind, and spirit. Life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. Discover the I wills of God. I will rescue him, protect him, answer him, be with him in trouble, deliver him, honor him, satisfy him with long life, show him my salvation. What I felt was loved and treasured. God spared my life twice in three days. The good Lord had given me a second chance. Call 1-800-700-7000 or visit CBN.com. The I wills of God, the latest teaching from Pat Robertson. And welcome back to the broadcast. Rwanda endured a bloody genocide and saw as many as 800,000 people murdered. It was mostly Hutu people following orders to kill those who identified as Tutsis. And their killings unfolded over the course of about 100 days. This year, the country marks the 25th anniversary of this dark period in its history. And its people have made some amazing strides. 
Well, CBN News anchor Ephraim Graham is just back from the land of a thousand hills. And Ephraim, you're working on a number of stories about mm -hmm. the recovery going on. This is not your first trip, but what story really stood out to you the most on this trip? You know, I'm always amazed at the stories of forgiveness. And there's one particular story. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Emmanuel and a woman by the name of Elise. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet them, spend time with both of them. You can take a look at some video of the two of them together. And you will see it looks like these two best friends. Well, uh, indeed they are right now, but uh, Emmanuel was actually a Hutu okay. who uh, cut off the hand of Elise. Uh, and if you look closely, her hand is missing. Uh, he also was a part of the group that literally sliced her baby in two. Oh, no. Now you see them walking together. You'd find that yeah. hard to believe. She missing. has forgiven him. He approached her and asked for forgiveness, and they are now working together to build homes for the homeless in Rwanda. It oh is an amazing my. story of forgiveness, and I have to say, that is just one of many. Uh, I, I am just floored at their ability to I'm forgive. I'm totally floored. Yeah. What, <laughs> what do people credit their ability to forgive like that? You know, one of the first names to always come up is the country's president. They said that he fostered that uh, the need for forgiveness. That was one of the first things they worked on when he came in and, and helped to bring the genocide to an end, yeah. that we can't move further until you, we begin to to forgive and heal. Uh, so that's one thing. But of course, the church also working hand in hand with the government um, to, they say, change people's minds, change people's hearts, and then begin to change their wallet. So they were thinking mind first, heart second, and then we could worry about the economy of this country. Uh, that's a, a worship service uh, there that we had the opportunity to attend. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that came from that service and speaking with those people is say, we don't identify as Hutu, we don't identify as Tutsi, we are Rwandans, all of us. So where do things stand now? Is the fighting over? Is there still friction? Fighting over? Uh, friction hard to find, really hard to find, especially when you see um, these people working side by side. Were they Rwanda just Muslim at all? Were, was there a Muslim? It was a variety. It, it, was, it, it, it was a variety. Rwanda now largely Christian, okay. uh, but I can say this for them. Um, the economy, I have to say this before I go. Uh, the, the Rwanda right now, 29th uh, as far as the ease to do business in the world okay. and number two to do business in the, in the continent of Africa. Amazing. And it jumped, I want to say, but over the course the of the last year's 11. Oh, well, the coffee. The coffee. <laughs> the coffee. Uh, it, it may not be as good as Hanoi, but it was. It, it's delicious. And I brought lots back, too. <laughs> Did you? I just got back from uh, the Kilimanjaro area in southern Africa, and their coffee is very good, too. It's very good. There's a theme going mm -hmm. on through this show. Strong and good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Efren. Great report. When you give, Smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. My husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Hello? Is this thing on? Hey, kids, do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah. Well, do you? Yeah. Then you're gonna love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. 
You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. The Supreme Court heard arguments this week in a crucial case, the Peace Cross, a memorial for World War I soldiers in Bladensburg, Maryland. Critics are calling it unconstitutional. But defenders point out that crosses marked most graves those of those killed in that war. As Paul Strand reports, that gives this case greater importance. Moms of 49 Bladensburg area soldiers killed in World War I designed the Peace Cross in memory of their sons. Here 100 years later, the legal team defending the cross, which is now on public land, believe this could be the most crucial religious liberty case the Supreme Court handles this term. It could put an end to judges and bureaucrats deciding if a religious symbol or display is too religious or secular enough. This area of the law is just leading to absurd results. It's leading to uh, city councilmen having to go out there with rulers to make sure that they have enough reindeer uh, around a nativity scene to make sure that it is a secular enough of a display. Jeremy Dice's team hopes the court agrees if a symbol or display doesn't force people to accept religion, it isn't too religious. The passive monument isn't forcing you to do anything. This monument in particular is just there to remember 49 men who def died defending our freedom. Maryland's governor took to Facebook to defend it. This monument was never meant to be a religious object. It was to honor our veterans, which we're going to fight to protect. But a team of atheists, humanists, and secularists object that the Peace Cross is on government land and maintained by the state. That the government on this piece of property is favoring a religion with this huge symbol that when you come across the bridge or approach it from any of the highways, you see nothing but this huge Christian cross. Renee Green talked to Lowe and other opponents of the cross for her documentary, Save the Peace Cross. It gives the impression of Christianity and nothing else, and it gives the impression of government endorsement of Christianity. In the suit against the cross, one atheist said he was traumatized driving by it. Green appears in her documentary to point out that many telephone poles are in the shape of a cross. If the plaintiffs win this lawsuit, Will all the telephone poles need to be modified? I just hope that they are not traumatized by telephone poles while driving. But all humor aside, this case has serious implications. Symbols like the Ten Commandments and Nativity have both won and lost in various courts. Now one of the world's most beloved symbols, the cross, is on the line. The Supreme Court of the United States is the last best hope for this memorial. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Bladensburg, Maryland. Thank you, Paul. And finally, today I want to congratulate my dear co-host on getting married. Woohoo! Woohoo! That's awesome. <laughs> and Tell you us were about. There. I was. You were there. Tell us about it. You got video, right? Show it. Look, got... look at this. We there got... we are. There's my little flower girls, my nieces, Kellyanne and Keaton, and, Bill, our and handsome my husband, my Bill. My Bill. Yes. And uh, everybody said it was a fun one. There's my dad. My dad walking me down the aisle. He's 80 years old, and Beautiful. he finally got to walk me down the aisle. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank God. And, and then you went on a honeymoon to Africa. We did. Uh, there we are. We are in the Serengeti at this shot. Um, Bill's got his new camera there. We had happened upon some lions. Uh, we stayed in a tented camp, wow. and uh, nothing between us and the wild animals but the tent. But Beautiful. thank God we made. We, we came back. Amen. Goodbye, everyone. God bless. Bye-bye.